Hey everyone, Ben Kumu Radio, episode number 315. So, today's show. You're in for a treat, as always, standard. I have known this man for a while. I can't give you an exact date. We'll probably go over that in a minute. But we were brought together at one of our conferences a couple of years ago. And this man has had an incredible personal journey. Uh, an incredible journey as a coach and that has taken many forms over the years and that's what I'm really excited to delve into today. How that looks, why it looks the way that it does and how someone transitions their body and mind into a coach and then really evolves yet again many times as a coach when you start to actually look at the problems that people face in their everyday lives. So you're listening to this right now thinking, do you know what, this is where I'm going on my fitness journey and actually these are my roadblocks. And the chances are your roadblocks are way, way deeper and way, way more layered than you actually potentially appreciate. And I think as you evolve as a coach, you try and look to explore and understand the real roadblocks that people have to enable and create change in their lives. Anyway, enough of me waffling. Uh, Dave Cottrell, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi, good to be here. Dave, um, so let's delve into the story a little bit. See, people have got some context and they know who on earth this Dave guy is. Dave, who are you? What's your journey into this health and fitness space? Because as we were talking online, you used to be a sound engineer. I did, hence the big microphone right here for the people who are watching on video. Um, okay, leaving that question open-ended for me is a really bad idea. I'll try not to go for 45 minutes. The super quick version is... In school, I was bullied for being smart. And by smart, I don't mean I'm a super nerd or anything. What I mean is I went to the 14th worst school in the country. Um, and by those standards, I was pretty damn smart. It was in Liverpool, um, in Anfield, near enough to the stadium. And I was bullied for being smart initially, which led to me developing non-purge bulimia, which led to me being pretty overweight. Then I got bullied for being overweight. Um, and also at the time, my mum was rate made redundant from her, um, the company she was working from and set, set up as an entrepreneur herself. So for the first five or six years of that, she didn't make hardly any money. So I was also bullied for being poor. Um, this kind of led to some very low self-esteem things. And, you know, basically my number of stones was always above my age basically until the point I was 24 and um, was the only time that my weight was below my age. I was 23 stone at 24, 23 stone six to be yeah, specific. Yeah, that's not, that's not great, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the thing is, I always had used kind of like my fatness as, as a suit of armor. I'd wear T-shirts that said fat people are harder to kidnap. I'd do that thing where I'd self-deprecate to make myself in, you know, invulnerable to other people, but really inside I was feeling like absolute crap about it. Um, and then when I was 24, I basically had I had one son, another son on, my, on the way, and I totally and utterly copped up my first marriage and went to it, what, what I would say is the point of the whole rock bottom thing. I was living on my own and um, just like, I blew out one of my knees when I was out dancing, like, and like the weight was just a serious issue for me. And um, at the new year that year, it was like the first new year I'd had on my own since I was about 16. And one of my friends came up to me. I, I decided, you know what, I'll do the, I'm a bachelor again. I'll do the whole thing. I'll throw a house party around the place I was renting. And I invited a load of friends over. And one of my friends said to me, right, you know what, this time next year, we're both going to, uh, we're going to see what, how much weight we can lose over the next course of next year. And this time next year, we'll take our tops off, have a photo taken, and the winner will get 500 quid. Now, being the self-deprecating, not, not really, you know, I was not bothered about my fat kind of guy I was. I was like, oh, I'll take, I was about 10 drinks in as well. I was like, I'll take my top off right now. Come on, let's have the photo taken. I don't need to lose weight and all this. But then when I woke up and the hangover settled, so probably January the 3rd at that point, <laughs> um, I thought to myself, well, this guy's got like a stone and a half to lose, and I've got quite a lot more than that so i actually felt that thought of that in a positive light and i thought you know what i've got way more chance of winning this than he did and originally i did it just to piss him off to be perfectly honest um he's like good friend been friends since we were 15 we'd had little challenges before in the past where he always said like he was going to catch up to me on playing the guitar and never did and stuff like that and i used to just love because he was he's, he's one of these people that when he does apply himself to anything he's a brilliant at everything so um any chance to actually beat him at something I was I was going to go for. So to say it was a personal journey at first, it wasn't. It was to basically piss this guy off. 
And three months in, I'd lost three stone. And for the first time, you know, I was 20, just under 20 stone at that point. And the first time in my life, people were like giving me compliments and talking about like the improvements uh, I've made. Um, my second son was born at that point. And um, for a brief period, me and the mum got back together. Um, and well, I spent the rest of that year kind of trying, like basically just trying to lose weight, but in a really bad way in the whole eat less and move more, which works great at first. But then when you realize that in order to do it, you've got to continue to eat even less and move even more. I was doing things like going around to my mum's house and swimming for an hour and then coming out and eating like five turkey slices. And that was like my food. It was terrible. But I did manage to get myself down to like about 17 stone that time around. And then that plateaued for a few years. Like marriage was doomed, like was basically doomed to failure from before that really. But it, when that finally failed, I went into a really disruptive, I ended up in a horrible relationship for a year. And off the back of that relationship, I was like, you know what? I actually really need to take care of myself. And taking care of myself is not something I'm good at. I'm really good at taking care of other people. Mm-hmm. And I'm not good at taking care of myself. But I started Thai boxing. And I became accountable to an instructor there. And I really wanted to get to a certain weight. Bearing in mind, at this point, I'm probably about 70 and a half stone. And he basically said he wanted me to be 90 kilos, so like 14 stone two, in order to fight. And I really wanted to fight. So... I basically then started to learn about nutrition, about training, about fitness, and, and started doing a sport that I enjoyed. And um, I managed to get down to the 14 stone and have a fight. And so I went from 23 stone six to 14 stone two at Miletus, a total of nine stone and four, I think, lost. And this is where it all really changed because that was amazing. But I got to that point and I'm like, right, what now? I looked at my stomach, still didn't like the way it looked. Mm-hmm. Still, still didn't like the way I felt. You know, loved the fact that I could box and run around and like had loads, loads more energy, but still wasn't good with me. You know, it's like there was always the next fight and the next fight, and then I started hating being that, having to be that weight in order to fight because I wasn't happy at that weight. And I think if I've ever shared my before and after, it's actually a before, during, and after. It's biggest, thinnest, and then happiest. Mm. So I went on a continued journey at that point, and that was. That was probably around about the same time that I started listening to you. So I was um, the sound engineering thing was failing miserably. So as a result, I'd been demoted um, to to the, the role of house husband. I say demoted. That sounds really derogatory. I'm sorry. It wasn't meant to be. What I meant was I'd been like because uh, my wife um, at the time, well, my new my, my current wife. <laughs> oh, it's complicated, isn't it? Um, because she's working all day. I was at home most of the time, so I was looking after the dog, I was looking after the house and doing all that stuff and just ultimately thinking that the sound engineering stuff was failing because that the industry was failing and people had iPhones and could record it. And as you said on the sound check before, is it as complicated as it, as it doesn't look? Mm-hmm. It's like most people think it's easy. I'd have clients that come in, record an awesome album with me, and then the next thing I know is like six months later on the SoundCloud is this thing that's just recorded for a phone and it sounded terrible. But I'd let myself believe, and beliefs are hugely important in what I do now, but I'd let myself believe that the industry was at fault, that I couldn't win in that particular industry. And um, I was listening to your podcast and I was like, you know what, I need to do something. Like me and Alona plan to have a, a child of our own at some point. We've got my two that, um, that like that are here half of the week, but we want to have one of our own. And when we do that, she wants to be able to take the time off work without worrying about money. And I wasn't really providing for us at the time. So I was like, I need to move into something that I love just as much as music. And I'm like, all right, what else do I love as much as music? And the only answer that came back was fitness. I was in the gym five times a week, mm-hmm. um, maybe even six, maybe even seven. <laughs> and um, so, and I was listening to your podcast and I thought, you know what, why not? And like, literally, I remember a point kind of sitting in my kitchen while I was cleaning, while I was doing like, do, like cleaning the sides. And I used to have your podcast on the whole day while I was cleaning the house. And I was like, right, one day, and this is, I'm going to cry when I say this now. I was like, one day I'm going to be on that podcast. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to transition. I'm going to do this and I'm going to get to that level. So this is a huge kind of like big thing for me today. Um, and then off the back of that, I, I met you, I, I, I qualified that year and I got, and basically, and I met you. When you really, say qualified, you mean as a PT? As a PT, yeah. yeah. So I just went and did the whole level two, level three intensive course thing. Um, and yeah, basically I qualified in the September and I was, de- I was determined that I wasn't just going to be another PT. 
Um, so I joined uh, the academy the following April, and um, and then I met you. At, the first time we met was a body power. It was first thing in the morning. You were trying to skulk around and not be noticed, and I'm like, oh my god, it's Ben Coomba. <laughs> and um, <laughs> And I thought, and I remember thinking straight after that, I'm like, that's probably exactly what he was trying to avoid. Nice. Um, and then I joined the academy in the April, and then I met you at the first time in the October. And um, I rem- basically, I remember having a chat to you saying, I want to be more than just a PT. I want to continue my growth, I want to continue my development, and I want to go into the realm of teaching. And I always thought that would be teaching other PTs, teaching people nutrition, doing a similar sort of thing with what you do. Um, and I moved on from that to kind of, I was speaking to Alex Manos. Basically, BTN's played a huge role in my life. Um, I was speaking to Alex Manos, and he pushed me on, in the direction of CNELM, which is where I did my, I started, I should just say, my nutrition degree. Mm. And then halfway through this nutrition degree, we did a coaching qualification of like of basically NLP. Now, I suppose one of the big things I've missed out of this entire backstory so far is the fact that I have type 2 bipolar disorder. So I was diagnosed at 14. I've been on. I was on antidepressants a lot of the time through my teenage years. I was on them again in my 20s, and um, I've been through a lot of counsel, a lot of CBT, a lot of NLP, a lot of mindfulness, all of that stuff. So when I went to this course, what and I've also I'd also done a half day with Stephen H because I wanted not for mindset for or for coach for coaching, but for my own personal kind of mindset side of things. Because as I said before, I got to that whole position with my body and I still wasn't happy. And um, happiness ultimately was what I wanted, really. And um, one of the things that I found that once I started coaching is that, as I said, I'm really good at looking after other people, not so much looking after myself. I found out that looking after other people is a really good way for me to look after myself. Like, it gave me a schedule. It gave me a timetable. It gave me people that I had to be there for, and that gave me purpose. And that Mm -hmm. was awesome, and I love that. But when I'm doing this coaching qualification and the guys in the room, like all the people, the other students and all the instructors were like, my God, you're really good at this. And when I passed it, the the examiner turned around and just said to me, if you don't use this in your business, it will be an absolute sin. And um, I've got massive daddy issues. I still have to lose him, like my dad leaving when I was six. So anytime that a male gives me that type of approval, I'm like, whoa. (laughs) And... um, so I was like, okay, that was pretty strong. I'm not used to being, I'm used to being good at what I do, but I wasn't ever used to being the best in the room. Mm. And um, and each one of the students in the class was like, I want to go to Dave because like for the next, for the next sort of, when we do the next exercise, and this was going to me the first time I was learning techniques and they wanted that because I was getting breakthroughs with people. And I just said, I thought, you know, one of my big kind of rules is that you get better at the things that you do often. And because I'd spent a lot of time receiving this type of, like those types of treatments, I think I just picked things up intuitively. Um, and I was all set to deliver a mind, um, sorry, a nutrition seminar at my gym like four weeks later. And I was driving home and I thought to myself, you know what, with that nutrition stuff, I love it, but people need to stick to nutrition for a long period of time in order to get any sort of any sort of impact. And so you, you could go out there, I could educate and I could meet and I could impact and I didn't really know what the impact's gonna be once the people leave that room. I thought if I do this right, I can have impact with every person in that room there and then with the mindset stuff. And the, the thing was that just planted the seed in my head that said, I'm never going to be sat in a well-lit office with a plant to be able to helping people overcome celiac disease ever again, despite the fact that that stuff fascinated me and still does. Like the day before I was like this mindset stuff. Um, I made so many breakthroughs with my own mindset and I was making breakthroughs with people in the room. And I just thought, you know what, there's, there's something here. There's something huge here. And so I basically went to the, did the same seminar, but instead of doing it as nutrition, I did it as mindset. And I had an absolutely massive response to it and then started, started putting bits and pieces of mindset into my coaching with my clients. Their results started getting better. Um, one of my sayings was always, it's not just about losing weight. And the things that my clients were doing outside of their weight loss was just was amazing. You know, we had people like overcoming alcoholism. We had people kind of... Um, getting out of toxic relationships, um, working with eating disorders, all sorts of things, and just you know being able to actually help these people that before I wouldn't have necessarily been able to. Like it always been, oh, we can't get any further until you ditch the booze, or we can't get any further until you know you go and see someone and get this under control. And um, yeah, it's just gone from there really. In that fact that I, I, moved, I did that first seminar, then I did about 
about a seminar a month last year just trying to kind of get around do visit other gyms and um, training with other like working in collaboration with other personal trainers other people at own facilities um and yeah that's i think roughly up to now <laughs> dude the reason why i love uh, your story and stuff is because it's a real person going on a real journey discovering their real self and then looking to help other people discover their real selves and that's why i resonate with what you've done and the different layers of progress that you've gone th- gone through as a person i think it's amazing and you know this podcast has been through so many transitions you've been around throughout the whole of the podcast you've listened to all the shows you've seen me evolve as a person my understanding of people and our relationships with ourselves with food with training with everything and everything that I have developed has kind of been turned on its head in the last 18 months and included more mindset work because it's just it's literally the be all and end all my fat loss for life programs now got about 40 days of mindset stuff in it the BTN Academy's now got loads more mindset stuff in it there's probably the most talk that we have in our community which you're part of is probably a lot of the time around mindset as well because that's where people are struggling um before we go on i'm I'm wondering um if you're happy to talk about it because i'm also fascinated in the relationships that we have and the dynamics that exist between ourselves and other people you had and spoke openly about several failed relationships um why do you think they were having reflected on them now based on where you were as a person and almost how you behaved okay well you're getting the exclusive on exclusive on this because i've never even talked about this on any of my own stuff um, here we go uh, okay so first marriage you know i said i, I had daddy issues because my dad left right yeah, well me too. i am i also have have mummy issues in a different way like basically you know the whole I think there's no real or wrong. There's no real or wrong way to parent because my parents couldn't have been more different, and yet I picked up. I would say problems would be the would not would be um, maybe too harsh a term, but from my dad because I never got that love and I never got to hear him say he was proud of me or anything like that. He left when I was six and he died when I was eighteen, and never got to find out whether he'd actually love what I do now, um, which is, is hard. Um, but on the flip side of that, my mum was and continues to be like the embodiment of unconditional love. And as a result, she set the bar really, really frigging high for any woman that would follow. Um, and um, I won't go, I won't mention anyone's names because it's not fair on the, the I, I mentioned Alona because she's still with me now, but I won't mention the names of the other mm-hmm. two because it's not fair on them. But the, the mum of my first kid, um, first two kids, sorry, my only two kids, <laughs> God. Um, we got together when when I was 17, and I literally believed that I'd, I'd not had, she was my first girlfriend, I'd not had anyone else, like I'd not had another, another girlfriend before that, you know, barely, only just probably kissed the girl for the first time the year before. And I was convinced, I mean, my brother was the same, he, he, he kind of like fell in love with his first girlfriend and was convinced that um, it was the only person that would ever love him. They're like a self-esteem thing, really. And for me, I was like, oh my God, I'm convinced that this, this girl's the, third, the only person that's ever going to love me. We started seeing each other on the 26th of Feb of, of 1999. And then I got engaged to her on, nine, on the millennium, which I was, well, still 17 at the time. And we were married by the time I was just 20, she was 19. Um, and bearing in mind that my eldest son, is now 13 i have we had him when when we were both 23 so really really young um i was convinced that this was it and that was that was what i'm going to get and you know basically if someone gives you a bit of attention like put a ring on it kind of thing um but the problem was for me i find it very very difficult to feel loved enough even now like it's something i identify and it's something that I put in, when when I realised that I'm not getting that level of affection or whatever that lives up to what my mum's standards were. I mean, I I I say this completely as a joke that like I could I could punch my mum in the face and she'd still give me a hug off the back of it. Like she's seen me through some of my worst pain points in depression. She's seen me like literally like slice my arms to pieces, scream at her that it's all her fault, and then still held me through the night. Mm. It's like so, um, so that to me. 
and I know this is wrong and this is kind of like this, but to me, I was like, that's what a woman is. That's how a woman should treat someone. Mm. Like, that's how, that's what, that's what true love looks like. And in a way, I think that's maybe what a parent's love looks like because that's the kind of love I have for my kids. You know, it's like I would do anything for them no matter what they did to me. Um, and I think I learned to love unconditionally from her. And I think in relationships, we tend to expect that the other person is going, and you, you've talked about this, I think in the past, um, that you, uh, when you did your own counseling, um, that we expect the other person to love us in the way that we show our love. Mm. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm a musician, I'm a poet, I like, I'm, I'm a writer, it's all this stuff. And that's how I express my love for my my for my partners. And basically, that I've, I've never, I've, I've well, I say never have that in return. I didn't get that in return from my first wife at all. And as a result, I felt unloved, not through any fault of her own, but through basically fault of my own, like in the fact that I didn't know what that love came in different packages back then. Um, and then the second relationship, so that broke down because of that. And the second relationship that was the really bad one was that that woman was the kind of essentially the female version of me in terms of was like, would write me poems, would like, would express a love in just this crazy amount of way. But this, but then almost like, I don't know if it's like borderline personality disorder or something, but where that you, where you actively want that connection, but then you also actively push it away. Mm. She would like literally express it all like this, and then she'd go completely the opposite direction and be the most distant person in the world. Um, and throughout that entire relationship, I was just like, "What am I doing wrong here?" And I took all the blame because I took the blame. I, in hindsight, I'd taken the blame for my first relationship at the time, and now I'm like, "Right, well, what am I doing wrong here?" What? And I, I took it all extremely personally. Like had, and then she just kept on moving away and going, going and staying at different places around the country, staying with friends and all the rest of it. And I was just like, my head was just all over the place. I just, um, I just with that, I think it was kind of like, I don't know. I, I still to this day don't, I, I, I still to this day don't really know what caused any of that really. I think it was just a, a I don't know, a collision of two people, like two mm. kind of very, very, very emotional people that when we kind of went, all in on certain things, you know, the certain chemical reactions happen when two, when, when two things, you know, are combined and what actually came out of ours was just destructive and horrible. And I ended up like completely utterly broken off the back of that one. And I, I basically disappeared to Thailand for a month and, um, off the back of it, like, totally and utterly I wouldn't say forgot my kids, but like, I, but I went, I, I, I wanted to run away from absolutely everything. And for me, I have been suicidal three times in my life. So this was a safe, at least a safer version of running away that I can come back from. Um, so I disappeared to Thailand for like a month. And uh, I, I was, while I was out there, I was just like, you know what? I've got to start taking care of me. Like, cause I was doing the Thai boxing at that time anyway. That was like, felt, felt like the right place to go. <laughs> and um, I actually, at that on that trip, ended up in the ring doing a fight, like with, you know, again, in a, it were against an actual Thai person. Admittedly, a retired Thai person who could have killed me and didn't. So I'm very <laughs> grateful that he didn't. Um, but that was kind of the beginning of my. I, would, I wouldn't say it's the beginning of my self discovery in total because I'd always been into that. But it was the it was where I got really serious about my self discovery. And I promised myself, you know, I'm going to have six months of just being me because I've never been me like since since the age of 17. Like I've been lived with my parents. Then, I, then I got with my first wife when I was seventeen. I, I lived with her like right the way up until I went into this other relationship, and I lived with her right the way up until I went to Thailand. But yeah, and um, yeah, so I decided, you know what, it's time for me to learn to love me because my big, in fact, you know, in terms of the relationships with other people, I didn't have a relationship with myself. Like I just, I didn't, didn't really know what was important to me. I didn't know what. I really wanted out of life. All I thought I wanted was I wanted love from a woman and I wanted, you know, and for me that had to have a very deep emotional component and a very deep physical component. Otherwise it just wasn't enough. And I was like, I hadn't sort of even looked at where that need, those, those needs had even come from. Mm. The reason why I wanted to go there with that conversation and, you know, obviously thank you for being honest and open with that which is what I want this show to be about the reason why 
we go there is because I want everyone that listens to this to be able to have moments of self-discovery and have moments where the light bulb comes on and say, well, that person worked through that, so I can work through that. And it gives us a certain amount of inner strength. And the other reason I wanted to do that is because what I've seen from you over the years is that you have been able to identify, as have I, with every area of your character for its strengths and its weaknesses and work to that to your advantage. And I think in the kind of self-help world, in the, you know, the people that talk about motivation and mindset, it's not about ignoring the stuff that you're not good at or, you know, you, you there's no there's nowhere to hide. It's about identifying with that, becoming at one with that, working to make sure that that is not negative. And you've you've shown areas whether you do that in your personality, and then go all in on your strengths as a person. Um, mm. So even like when you started today, you're like, I am the guy that will help everyone. Um, yeah. And I'm and and it's like now I'm interested to find out from you those areas that could be negative. How do you try and bring systems or thought processes or habits into place so that they remain a positive as possible part of your character okay um i'm a very big fan of using everything you've been through like you, you've um i know you've said you've been to see tony robbins and you've also seen that i'm not your guru mm -hmm. you know where he interacts with the woman at the very beginning on the video on the film where he says basically if you've got to blame it for all of the bad you've got to blame it for all of the good too which he's, yep. talk, he's talking about i'm a big fan of that like for example <clears throat> it's strange when i was chatting to when i was doing an interview for my own podcast the other day I was talking to another mum. I say another mum. I'm not a mum. <laughs> another parent. Um, and we were talking about this idea that both of us have been through quite a lot of adversity as kids. And now we wouldn't wish that on our children one bit. Like, I don't want my kids to be bullied. I just don't. Um, she'd been sexually assaulted. And she didn't want, she obviously nobody wants that for their mm -hmm. children. But at the same degree, adversity does build a certain degree of character. And by kind of, I often think that like people who've been through a lot of crap are, are in a better position to actually then go on to further develop than someone who isn't, who hasn't. Like someone who's just had like I, I'm very careful not to let my kids get too damn comfortable because like and I can't you can't fake adversity. I can't just go and plonk them in the middle of the woods somewhere and say you've got to get out of this and you're only going to wait going to going to do it through teamwork because I'd probably get arrested. Um, and I'd be worried that actually one of them didn't come back out again. But they need that, and we all need that. So in terms of what you've been through, I've, one of the videos that I've made is called Your End is Not Defined by Your Stars. And it talks about how from being bullied, from being a victim, from all of this stuff, I've now – I don't use the word victim anymore. It's survivor. But it's um, I've now come to a position where I can empathize with people. I've come to a position where – I can, I have the context to actually help someone. Like, I think one of the best tour guides you could ever have go if you're trying to go through hell is someone that's prepared to go through it with you or has already been through it rather than someone who's just looking up from above and going, yeah, there's the path. It's obvious. Um, because you don't always see the pitfalls. Now, there's, there is, as you say, there's a, there's a positive and negative to all that. And one of my things that I'm very careful of, again, as a coach is not to rescue the client too much because it's it's important to take them on a journey and help them to learn from that journey themselves. But as coaches, and particularly when we've like, oh yeah, we did it, like, you know, ex-fatties were, 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 were as bad as ex-smokers sometimes in terms of getting fanatical. And um, it's like, yeah, we did it, and the, oh, this is how you do it. And it's, it's, it's so easy, and here's the blueprint, oh, and there you are. And it's like, and they've not learned anything from that journey itself. Like the, the we learn so much from our failings, mm -hmm. and all we wanna do, all we wanna do is we wanna help our clients or help our children or help our families make the same do the same path that we did but with less failings you need to let them fall sometimes you need to let them trip sometimes and um so i'm not sure if that answers the question i think i've gone off on a tangent but yeah it yeah. did i mean <laughs> you have i used your failings and what has not been right to identify and say okay i accept the good in that it's like you know we can look back at our, our backgrounds what shaped us as people and say okay I wouldn't want that on someone else, but I've learned from that so that I can not do that myself. Like, you know, we talked about parenting. We can look at maybe some of the parenting techniques that we were exposed to when we were younger and say, well, I'm not going to do that because I don't think it 
positively affected my character. And yes, I'm aware of that and I wouldn't change that because that is who I am. But there could be more positive ways to go about that area of parenting. And, you know, the reality is sitting here as, you know, 30 odd year old people, we have to say that these last 30 years of programming that we've had in our environment, it's not going to change. You're not going to undo that. That's a huge amount of um, programming at a young age that forms our habits and our beliefs. So what I don't want at any point in time is for anyone to ever run away from that or hide from that or Mm. feel weakened by that, feel scared of it, uh, feel afraid of it. None of that. You've got to go all in on that because honestly, if you don't, you can't move positively forward. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd sort of slightly disagree, but in terms of, yes, there are things that I think of as being our operating system, like the things so that you, we're not going to be... disagree with. Sorry. Well, so you said about the bit about that. We've got all this stuff that can't be undone, so to speak. Now I'd, I'd say that that's to the most part true in the fact that we've got our operating system like that mm-hmm. is there the default, the stuff that was there and probably actually might've even been there from birth. We don't really know yet. And then you've got the programs that run on top of that, like the same as kind of like, you know, you're on your phone, you've got the apps and some of the apps we can get rid of, we can delete them and we can work oh, yeah. around them. But the majority of it, yeah, there is this deeper programming. So, and when it is I, definitely... so just to clarify, so when I, yeah, when I say that's unchangeable, it's like I'm talking about our deepest rooted values. Okay, so yeah. Our deepest rooted values are things that we need to be aware of and control and they will inherently not change but what how we behave on top of that and yes. how that is actually expressed every day in our environment i would agree that that is what we as people are working to change or enhance so that we live a better life yeah absolutely cool yeah we um the default stuff yeah it's um it's, it's, it's better to work with it than against it. Something that I've, I, I learned, I relearn that like practically every year. Um, one of the big ones I, I relearned this year, and this is something that a lot of the people I've spoken to on the academy have recommended a book called The Four Tendencies, mm. um, was this idea of me being an obliger, which is, means I'm much more likely to accept external account, sorry, ex- external responsibilities than internal expectations. So in order for me to actually work with that, if I want to do, if I want to take care of my own self-care, if I want to take care of my own weight loss, like it works really well for me to have a coach, even though I'm a coach myself, um, because of the accountability structure, because I'll, you know, my default programming means I'll let me down, but I won't let other people down. So the best way to not let me down is to set things up that like that. So for example, I've got a weekly yoga session and a weekly massage now that I will go to because I won't let the person down that I'm supposed to be meeting and paying. And that working with that is enabling me to kind of do a lot more self-care than just saying, oh yeah, I'll book it in whenever, or you know, I'll do a massage when, when I pull something, or I'll do some yoga when I feel like I'm completely frazzled. You know, I'm right, it's letting me be more proactive with it. Nice, so let's talk about a coaching framework and how you've evolved as a coach. So you became a PT, you trained uh, as a nutritionist, and you then sort of started to see that actually the problems that you were seeing in other people were all mindset related. Talk to me about some of the biggest things that you see as common amongst a lot of your clients, because you seem to be developing a lot of your own theories and techniques around you know, helping people with their mind, their stress, um, yeah, so just talk me through that. I'll let you kind of spitball on how you're approaching your mindset work. Okay. Um, I was um, I was speaking to you know the person that you passed on for the um, for the mindset coaching with me a few weeks back. I was speaking with her the other day, and I said, and I don't like to use the word always because as soon as I say always, an exception crops up. But I said the vast majority of it is going to be about stress. We spent three hours together. Forty five minutes of those three hours were on stress. Um, stress is kind of, I'm seeing as the underpinning thing behind so many different issues. So like, if we look at, if we look at comfort eating, like often the time it's like, there'll be various emotions that a person, a person comfort eats for like emotional eating, but there will all, but the thing is underpinning most of those emotions will be stress. 
So some people it's to it's kind of like to feel good enough. So some people it's to feel in control. So some people it's to get rid of anger, to get rid of, and then some people it is just as obvious as to get rid of stress. And if you look at also say alcoholism, and the weird one I'm going to throw in in line with binge eating and alcoholism is the gym, which is a bit of a curveball to a lot of people. But bear with me, I'll get I'll get to why it is. Um, is this idea that um, that these things, a lot of these things cause more stress or cause more of the thing you're trying to avoid than they actually take away. So with alcohol binge eating, we can, we can get on board, but that's straight away. It's like, so alcohol, we have that first drink. It's like, it takes the, all the kind of the, you know, the stress away for a moment. But then we as nutritionists know what it does to us on a nutritional level and what it does to us on a hydration level, what it does to our sleep like the quality of our sleep, then the next day we're waking up with more stress. Now you put the emotional stress on top of that as a person who then regrets drinking that alcohol and they've got rid of maybe one or two bits of emotional mental stress and added five other pieces of stress into the equation. So the next day they're going in and they're a little bit higher up on the kind of, you know, their base level of stress that next day is a little bit higher up. Same thing with, um, with, and this is something I call slingshots and boomerangs. This is a boomerang. You throw it forward. It's got a positive intent only for it to come whipping back to give you more of the thing that you're trying to avoid. And same thing with, with binge eating. It's like a person wants to feel comfort. They want to feel in control. But then they have the food there, and then they actually suddenly feel out of control afterwards. They, they feel comforted while the serotonin and dopamine start hitting in the brain. But then afterwards they feel they've got this self-loathing thing come back and it becomes compounded. And then the choice is, do I go further down this rabbit hole and eat more and come back? Now, the thing is, with all of this stuff, it's an itch that needs to be scratched. You know, that comfort, that that, that connection, that lack, of, that lack of stress is an itch that needs to be scratched. And the problem isn't really, it's the, the problem is how the person is choosing to do that. So it's what I do is I call and I call at the minute I call it the work and recovery model. I've not got like I've not got a full name for it yet. But basically we've got all these things that constitute as work, right? Work is our work. All stresses go to the same place, right? So they all go to your hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal axis. <laughs> um, so you have all of this stress going to the same place. Your physical stress goes there. Your emotional stress goes there. Your mental stress goes there. And when that thing is full, that thing is full. That's when your kids can like not go to bed on time and you can end up screaming at them and five minutes later be like, why did you react to that? Because you've already got all these other stresses on mm. them. And that is a kind of something like, so the problem is now we're told that we're overworked. And this is, a, I, I like to link this into training because with training, we're like, we, we've talked about, or you've talked about in the past and, and, and written about the fact that a lot of people aren't actually overtrained, they're just under recovered. So if someone wants to train like an athlete, great, but you need to recover like an athlete too. We're training on a mental level, on a stress level, like an athlete every single day. We're doing work. We've got the family. We've got the kids. A lot of us are working outside of our work hours. A lot of us, even when we're doing things like watching TV or on our phone, getting triggered by that, we pick up the phone first thing in the morning. Like the soon, We go into this reactive mode as soon as we wake up. We're on the phone last thing at night. It disrupts our sleep. All of it. Stress, stress, stress. And the reason I said that workouts is a bit of an interesting one is because a workout, as we all know, takes away a certain degree of stress. But if you are going balls to the wall doing like the hardest, like, you know, it's like like hero wads every day, for example, um, the amount of physical stress that you are getting off of that workout overweighs the amount of emotional and mental stress that you're getting rid of. So if your cup is already pretty damn full, then that's why people get into like, that's how people end up into injuries, getting overtired and the stress, the, even the things that they think are helping them with the stress come whipping back and hurt them. So rather than immediately going to a person, right, I want you to work less, I want you to do less. If we can take away obvious stresses that are simple and easy, then great, but we can't often take away the number of hours someone's gonna work. And so much of the time I'm working with self-employed people anyway, so they really don't want to take away the number of hours they're working because they feel that if they wanna to get to their true vision, mm. then that's how they're gonna do it. So what I try and do is introduce more recovery into that, and the recovery is so key, it has to be something that is actual downtime. So we're talking, if you're sitting and watching a film, you're watching that film and you're watching that damn film. You're not on your phone at the same time, you know, because let's face it, every single one of us has got at least one account on, on Facebook or Instagram that we have on there just to wind us up. <laughs> like, we've got it there. We know it's going to wind us up every time we see it, but we don't unfollow it. And we are reacting to all of these things constantly. When people go for a walk, like they've got the phone on. When 
And I know the phone's going to, the phone does tend to come up a lot in this because we go into that multitasking thing. And as you well know, we can't multitask. We can only switch our brains being demanded on our, and the whole time it's stress. And the thing is, even good stress, like the, if you look at the, the definitions of stress, I think it was Hans Selye, the guy who sort of did all the initial research on it. There's distress, which is the one we're commonly, we commonly know of as like hard stress, but then there's eustress. So when I do all my coaching calls, I come off the end of them and I feel like so energized. I love them. I love doing this work. I'm going to feel absolutely buzzing when I come off the end of this. Um, but it is a stress on my system. So even the stuff that we consider to be good stress. So we need to make that time to back off, to to calm down, to create space. And it doesn't have to be huge and it's different from person to person as well. So for like for you know, you're a pretty hard working dude, you might want to just kind of put in five minutes of reading before you before you get out of bed, you know, and five minutes of like journaling or you you know, doing your planning, for example, get that brain dump out of the way like you did on Sunday nights. Like get that brain dump out, empties your brain out, enables you to get a better night's sleep. It can be as simple as that. But depending on where you are on that list, like where you where that work is, your and what your capacity for work is will depend on how much of this recovery you need. And um, to put it in like an actual real world example, so I don't know if you saw the one I posted on the BTN Academy recently, um, BTN community recently of my client who's just gone a month without drinking, mm-hmm. and she'd gone she'd gone 15 years of drinking a bottle of wine every single day, at least a bottle of wine every single day. If it got opened, it got finished. All we changed was we introduced recovery into the into her. Thing. We talked about the mindset aspects of it behind the scenes and all the rest of that. We, and, and we talked about the why and all that business. And that we did that for a few months, started working with her fitness, started working with her nutrition. And then one day it was like, right, okay, let's write out a list of what you, what you consider to be work. And for her, because as I said in the thing, she wasn't even leaving the house. So for her leaving the house was work. It was hard work. It was stepping outside of her comfort zone. So we looked at everything that was in the work category. And then we looked at the recovery category and there was nothing in there apart from kind of eating a healthy meal. And even for her at that point, because she'd not had much experience of cooking those types of meals, the preparation of that is still work. It's all relative to where you are at any given time. Mm. And um, and then we we'll looked at the recovery time and all we did is I said, right, okay, let's, you talk me through. It's super important that the client talks and talks you through this rather than you just suggesting things to them because it's kind of like inception. If they think it's their idea, they'll do it more. Um, I'm like, you talk me through five, six, ten things that we could do, for that you could do for this stress relief. And um, she's like, so she wrote down like crafts and coloring in and, and reading and getting to bed early, you know, watching the TV without right a phone, stuff like that. And um, like, and that night, she's like, and the other thing I set up for her was accountability. I said, right now, all I want you to do is I want every night, tell me how much you've drank every morning, tell me how much you've slept, because she wasn't sleeping well either. And then that night, I got a text message and I burst out crying when it came through because it just said, off to bed, no alcohol. And I just thought, off one day. One day, and she, she, I spoke to her the next day and she'd just done a bit of craft. She'd done a bit of crocheting and stuff. And she said, calmed her right the way down, just enough focus that her mind was off other things, but not so much that it felt taxing. And, all, and as a bonus, it kept both of her hands busy so she couldn't even reach for a glass. And she's not drank a drop since. She's lost a stone and a half. She's done a job interview. She's out of the house. She's driving on her own for the first time in years. And yeah, the transformation is amazing. And really all it came down to was increasing a bit of recovery. So that's that's what I love. That one little change, that tweak there, caused a massive cascade of other benefits in her life because that was one of the things that was holding back her progress as, as, a, as a person. And yeah, absolutely amazing. And I think what if we tied that into the conversation we had earlier, it's about identifying with what is actually going on. Um, And we quite often look for, and it it plays into the quick fix mindset that a lot of people have, is, okay, well, I potentially use coffee to wake up, I use alcohol to come down, and as soon as you get into the pattern of doing that, it does take someone else to force you to stand back and stage an intervention. And you brought up Tony Robbins earlier. He talks about this all the time. He says, people do need a moment where they have to wake up. So I'm standing here now saying, wake up, stand back, take stock, and then you can look at a solution that's going to move you positively forward. But we don't do that. We come in the house, we open the fridge, we grab the food, we cork the bottle of wine, 
And sometimes we, we literally don't even know we're doing it. But we have mm. that feeling of being tired or being hungry. And then we have an association with what we do to currently resolve that situation in our life. When ultimately we might know that there's something better, but we just don't spend the time to do the work to find out what better might be for us. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I do is I get the person to identify what is the itch you're trying to scratch here. So stress was the example there, but it might be something different. For someone, drinking is often for connection. Um, you know, for like, because their they're, they're mm. social group, they, they drink for that. For other people, um, you know, like what they might be kind of drinking for to forget something or to kind of because it, and that, that might mean they need some sort of counseling around that memory or whatever it may be. But then what I get them to do is like, right, what is the function of this? What is what is it trying to tell you? Because we have stress, anxiety, depression. We have these things for a reason. Those reasons have got a little bit hijacked since we don't have saber tooth tigers rocking around all over the place anymore. But the re- it's there for a reason and it's trying to tell you something. And if, you, if we can look at alternative behaviors, it's like, okay, how else could I do this? What else could I do instead of this? Um, and then choosing to be kind of like, you've got to basically put this roadblock in because the way the way it is at the minute is you've got these two paths and like in like in the forest and the path of the the old behavior is it's it's glorious. Your favorite music's playing. There's an ice cream stand off or down there. The, the weather's brilliant. The path's paved with gold. All the, you know, there's benches to sit down and flowers, birds singing, all that business. And your brain will take that in a split second and go down there. And in the other path of the new behavior. It's kind of like it's overgrown. There's nettles. You're wearing shorts. Um, it's like the trees are all like those scary trees that you see in kind of like fancy movies. The eyes poking through. The, it's foggy. It's horrible. And over time, each time we actively choose to say, you know what? Yes, I want to take this new behavior, but it's going to be hard. Because like, telling anyone it's going to be easy is the fastest route to failure. But like saying, yeah, it's going to be hard. And that's not a failing of the individual. That's just because the, the behavior itself is hard. Because what we do is we look at it and like, why can't I do that? I should be able to do that. Particularly as coaches, we're, we're so bad for this. I teach everyone else to do that. Why can't I? And it becomes about me. It becomes about why can't I? Well, what's wrong with me? Why can't I? And instead of about the problem that's in front of them. And what I need to do is look at that path and go, you know what? Yeah, it's dark, it's scary, it's hard, but I'm going to take it anyway. And each time they do that, they cut back a bit of those trees, they get rid of some of those nettles, they let a little bit of the sunshine in. And over time, that path becomes easier and easier to take. Now, like you said before about the, the default operating system and stuff, that other path, yeah, it'll become a little bit overgrown, the, the old path, but it'll probably always be there. And you may always have to deal with that. And that's okay. But you're going to be more and more equipped to take the other path, to take the new behavior, to do the thing that you want to do each and every time that you do it, accepting that those first few times are going to be bloody difficult. Mm. Fascinating, Dave. And I hope people listening to that think or feel that they have the power to stand back and look at those decisions, look at those processes, look at those thoughts. And um, I know that you want to uh, offer to help other people today, which I told you you're mental for doing because there's a lot of people that listen to this show, but you want to do it anyway. So, mate, I will let you do it. All right, cool. Well, I, you know, I am mental. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I have, this has been confirmed by at least three psychiatrists. Um, okay, cool. Well, I've been doing this thing called A Life A Day throughout the course of this year, and it is my aim to help 365 people for free throughout the course of this year. That's taken on various forms. In one form it will not take, it will not take the form of a direct handout of cash, so don't anyone bother asking for that. Um, I have supported charities and things like that, but the majority of them will have taken the form of a coaching call or a coaching session face-to-face if you're local. Um, and I've been basically, there's two promises about that I give about them. In fact, three promises, because I'm going to put the third one in as a bold one. The first promise is it's not going to sell you anything. I'm not even going to talk about other products if you come and have a call with me or you come and see me face to face. And, you know, it's not going to get you onto a mailing list or anything like that. Second promise is that it's completely confidential. So there's so many more stories I could share with Ben right now about where the stress models worked. But I won't because I've, Catherine, who I spoke about before, has given me permission to share her story. And unless I get permission, the story doesn't go anywhere. It's not going to turn up in a blog. And the third thing is that I will help you. That was, and that's the one that I didn't normally put in there, but I will help you. If you want one of these, um, I do them over Messenger or um, video calls or face-to-face for anyone. I'm in nearest to Liverpool, so like I'm in Southport, 
the near in the northwest. So if you want one of these, um, I've done 115 of them so far this year. I have 250 left to go. Um, give me an email, dave at cofitpt.com. So C-O-F-I-T-P-T.com with the subject of a life a day and um, providing I still have them left and you don't ask for something completely ridiculous. Um, <laughs> I reserve the right to say no. I haven't said no so far, so don't tempt me. Um, but yeah, providing I have them left. And this, this is my safety switch, you see, Ben, in case, in case I do get someone saying, um, can you give me your kidney? It's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, providing I have them left, I will sort you out. Well, Dave, uh, that's an amazing offer. So I suppose if you're listening to this and you think, do you know what? I like Dave's story. I like where he comes from, how he comes about it. If you'd like to reach out and get some help from Dave, then he said it. He'll give you a free coaching call. Uh, It's extremely generous. Um, Dave also gives a lot of time and you know, knowledge and insight in our BTN community, which is a a part of the Academy program, uh, which uh, Dave's been through, uh, which loads of conversations happen. Like every week people are talking about, you know, their own struggles, clients that they're working with. And Dave is quite often there uh, giving insight and help. So I just wanted to thank you, Dave, for continuing to help other people around you because you know even you know the btn community you know you're not you're not paid to be there it's just a community of people that have been through our education system and you continue to give and help and all that kind of stuff and i know that um we've been talking a little bit at the moment of how that might look in the future, whether there's um, an opportunity for us to help people on a bigger scale. If people would have listened to Monday's podcast, they would have heard me talk about um, me trying to get BTN a lot closer to its vision so that we are teaching nutrition that changes lives. And don't get me wrong, it's not just nutrition. It is all the stuff that we've been talking about today. Mindset, uh, looking after yourself, like all of this is wrapped up into one big bundle. It's not it's not exclusive, like nutrition isn't just nutrition, it all intersects with one another and you know, Dave's hinted on his journey, you are well aware of my journey and how it's evolved with uh, for myself. Um, so yeah, if you wanna reach out to Dave, do that. You've heard his email, dave at cofitpt. Um, if you'd like to be involved in our community and learn with us, then look at the BTN Academy, it's just btn.academy. Um, Dave, social media and stuff, where are you on the socials? Okay, um, my two best places. One is, if on, on Facebook, I don't really do much with the COFIT stuff anymore because I'm trying to work away from that and more towards mindset. So on Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash, forward slash mindset by Dave. Um, if you do only one thing off the back of this um, interview, Go to that page and watch and give me four minutes of your time and watch the video at the top called You Are Enough. Um, it's, you know, it's basically the best thing I've done ever. Um, and you will get a lot out of it. And then Instagram is just Cofit PT. Nice. Well, Dave, thank you very much for your time today. Um, thank I get you a feeling... for helping with a lifelong goal. <laughs> well, uh, I think I got a feeling you might be back on the show at some point. I don't know when. I think I think there's more to talk about. I think there's cool stuff uh, that's coming. You you and me have spoke, you know, um, for a while now, off and on about various different things. You are someone that is relentlessly helping other people, as am I. And I think when you can buy those two value systems, uh, good things can happen. So I look forward to the future, what that future looks like, who knows. But Dave, thank you very much again for everything that you do for the health and fitness industry. I do genuinely believe there is not enough people doing what we do. And I think if more people started to work on themselves and then look to help other people, because I don't think you are going to be successful if you do it the other way around. Don't get me wrong, there's an awful lot of people that are out there helping others, and that is incredible. The world needs that, but make sure you are in your best place first, that you can really give to other people, make sure your cup is full. And that is, you know, Dave's mission and my mission to help you realize your potential as a person and then to help you, you know, with your training and how you're going to go about helping the world. Um, so, Dave, uh, we're waffling. Uh, we better say goodbye. Goodbye. (laughs) Thanks to everyone for listening. If you've enjoyed this show and you know it can help someone else, tag them in, send it to them from iTunes, send them an email, send them a tweet, like however it is, doesn't matter. 
If you think this can help someone, send it to them. If you've never left a review for me on iTunes, it would be amazing if you would do that for me because it helps the show a lot. And if you want to share anything that you learned from today's show, you just want to chat to us, then you'll see it's always posted on social media on the Thursday. So engage in that post, have a chat with me and Dave, and just get involved in the conversation. Um, So yeah, get in touch with Dave, get in touch with me, Otherwise, we're out. I'll see you on Monday. No, Tom will see you on Monday. And then I'll be on next week's show with Ori Hofmeckler. Goodbye, everyone. Whoa, just before you go, a couple of things. Firstly, if you need my help at any point in time, reach out to my Facebook fan page, ask a question, and I'll get back to you. The reason I like my Facebook fan page is because I can send like voice memos back and it's really time efficient for me to be able to help as many people as possible if you want to find out just anything i'm up to keep abreast of social media make sure you're on my email newsletter and all of that info is at bencoomer.com if you want nutrition education in the future then have a look at the btn academy that's our online nutrition courses if you want to be coached by me then join my 90 day body and mind transformation program fat loss for life And if you're looking for clarity, honesty, simplicity, and research-proven supplements that taste awesome, then go to awesomesupplements.co.uk. That's my links. That's where to find me. That's where to find the cool stuff. I'm out. Have an awesome day. Hey, everyone. Vancouver Radio episode. Not sure. Doesn't matter. Um, This is actually a very rare occurrence.